journey. Any questions? No? Okay, Jenny, thank you so much for, for doing this. And uh, yes, floor is yours. So Je yeah, uh, Jenny is going to talk about multipolarity, China, etc. So please. Okay, I will uh, plunge on. Um, well, I've set myself the task of talking about 2020 as a new multipolar moment and the question of uh, how we go about assessing the current conjuncture in the international order. Um, clearly, last year will go down in history as the year of COVID. Um, it's also likely to be a reference point in the calendar of the world economy, as was 2008. Um, but in terms of uh, international order, will it be the year when a new Cold War uh, by the US on China started? Or will it be remembered as a moment when a more multipolar world emerged? Um, I'm going to refer to my book, not because I'm advertising it, it's a bit out of date, but uh, because I put a, uh, there was a, a quotation that I found, which absolutely fascinated me at the time, from a Chinese scholar. Uh, it, this was actually in an article he'd written in 1999, about 2020, and he was predicting that 2020 would be a situation in which one superpower, four major powers will be more evenly balanced, opening the way for the rise of regional groupings or new poles from the developing world. So the one superpower, the US, the four major powers, Japan, Russia, uh, China, and Europe would all become more evenly balanced. So how did he reckon that? So um, obviously the um, new Cold War broke surface in the US in July with Pompeo's speech in effect calling for regime change in China, um, which all but overturned the Nixon agreement, uh, which had provided the basis for stability in US-China relations uh, for 40 years. Um, but if Pompeo intended to make a unipolar grab for power, there were also many signs last year of US decline. And for the sake of brevity, I won't go through all of those because I think that's quite obvious. Um, the year finished with two remarkable developments seemingly fulfilling uh, the multipolar prediction with the signing of RCEP and uh, followed and no doubt aiding and encouraging the EU-China Investment Treaty. It's been agreed, but not yet ratified. Uh, the significance of these agreements lies in spanning developing and developed countries with the lesser imperialist powers of the EU and Japan finding common cause uh, with China um, and with ASEAN in the case of RCEP against the US. I'll come back to that later. But what I want to talk about is how China sees where it is at um, at the moment, because it's quite interesting with the 14th um, uh, five-year plan and so on. 2020 is seen as a gateway year into a new era of development, just as the open door policy adopted in 1980 saw China's rapid development over the next 40 years, the new period uh, which uh, is envisaged in the long-term guidelines up to 2035 is seen as one of major strategic development, the next key stage, not only in China's economic development, but also in its global role. And the path up to 2035 is, is framed by the notion of dual circulation. The official description of this model um, as a new development pattern where domestic and foreign markets can boost each other with the domestic market as the mainstay. Now, many commentators, at least that I've seen in the West, seem to up, s simplify this as a return to self-reliance with China, now intent on shifting away from export markets in response to the hostile policies and protectionism of the United States and the West. Um, and although dual circulation clearly does mark an adjustment in the balance between the international and the domestic, I think there's more that can be said uh, about dual circulation. So I just want to make a few points. First of all, it's not just a question of shifting um, to uh, shifting from ex exports to domestic demand. Um, it's also about supply with an emphasis on R&D emerging in industries and innovation in order to that China produce its own core technologies. Uh, the second point is that insofar as the open door policy focused on external markets, although the Chinese economy grew very fast, its development was very uneven and imbalanced. 
So dual circulation is also seen as an opportunity to redress these internal imbalances. And then uh, insofar as the uh, international economic and financial system um, is unstable and finance, uh, unstable and uh, uh, crisis ridden, and this is transmitted around the world via trade and investment, i.e. the circulation processes, dual circulation is also about addressing the weaknesses in the links in uh, China's domestic circulation in order that it can withstand the impact as it increases its openness to trade and investment uh, and international circulation. In this regard, it's interesting to note that Xi Jinping has asserted that the role of the state is key in influencing not only production, but also circulation. That state intervention is necessary to smooth the circuits and that dual circulation will in fact cement the role of the state. Um, so dual circulation is not simply about China turning inward, but also about significantly enhancing its international political and economic influence. It's about turning the vicious circle in which the international system, financial system dominated by US banks drains value out of developing countries into a virtuous circle in which the domestic and foreign markets boost each other. So I see dual circulation as a constant balancing and readjusting between the internal and uh, the external uh, by the state um, as, one of the, as the circuits react off each other. So if you like, it's walking on two legs, strengthening and smoothing the domestic circuit so the state can hedge against the volatility of international financial markets. And at the same time, China can come back and play a greater role in the international circuit as a stabilizing force. So I want to look very briefly at RCEP and the um, EU-China Investment Treaty. Um, so we could say developed and emerging uh, economies alike are looking nervously at the piling up of debt in the US and the prospect of international markets getting flooded with hot money. The EU, Japan and ASEAN have after all in the past found themselves made to carry the can for US prof profligacy. Europe in 1971, Japan and the Plaza Accord in 85, and then the Asian financial crisis in 1997. So we can see RCEP and the EU, China, uh, investment treaty uh, have been hastened by the uh, risk of international instability in the wake of COVID. Uh, the agreements show how China has been able to leverage the promise of its growing markets, domestic circulation, to set up arrangements with developed and developing countries together, um, with arrangements which present a different paradigm in which domestic and international circulation can become mutually reinforcing and stabilizing against the destabilizing factors in the international markets. So on the um, Europe-China Investment Treaty, China, um, the press has pointed out, conceded quite a bit, uh, but the agreement nevertheless, I think is a breakthrough in the pattern of developed countries monopolizing developing countries' economies. Its language is very much that of equality, mutuality and consultation. For example, it confirms each party's right to regulate labor and standards. In other words, upholds the international uh, sovereign rights. Rather than seeking to contain China, it is evident that the EU accepts China as a rising power and will contribute to its continuing development. One European report I read noted that on the one hand, the EU is being squeezed as China competes with its core technologies, but, Given that China is such a large market, there are opportunities in the coming years for EU firms to fill in the gaps as China upgrades. Uh, so, for example, opportunities to participate in the decarbonisation of the Chinese economy. On RCEP, I want to draw on an article by Horace Campbell in, uh, in um, Counter, uh, Counterpunch recently. And he sees the uh, uh, agreement as ASEAN driven. And it's serve, uh, uh, serving as a defense against the weaponization of US trade and finance um, and posing, uh, in fact, a direct threat to the dominance of the US dollar in the Asia Pacific and beyond. Um, 
He sees RCEP as an opportunity to advance uh, renminbi internationalization and also as a step towards establishing a new international financial architecture to replace the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. He also sees the agreement as having effectively killed the Quad, the emerging military alliance between the US, Australia, Japan and India. And he quotes Walden Bellow, who acclaims the return of the Bandung spirit, saying this opens the possibility for countries in East Asia to avoid any defence tie-ups that serve the interests of the big powers. I'd be a little more cautious. While signing up to RCEP, this hasn't stopped Japan reaching across to the UK to strengthen military and intelligence ties. COVID has opened the possibilities for international cooperation in medicine, and in this is serving as a catalyst for further cooperation, for example, in tackling climate change. Uh, Horace Campbell argues that this is to be built upon um, by progressive uh, movements. And he says, with the new US administration, the contradiction of global capital will dictate that progressive forces must intensify their efforts. Uh, in, and he identifies three areas, calls to limit US military spending, calls to establish a completely new international financial architecture and uh, an anti-racist agenda. Uh, my view is that uh, with the new stage in multipolarization, the objective conditions for change may be there, but it is early days and we have to think about the sub subjective circumstances. Xi Jinping has been talking about the protracted struggle for years ahead and a new long march. And I'll finish now with posing a few questions. It's clear that the US needs allies in order to maintain a balance of power against China, but has the moment for this been lost? Um, and how should we view the dynamics between the big powers? What opportunities are being opened for progressive forces and states? At what point can we actually say that imperialism has ended? I think it's actually possible to ask ask that question, even if we can't answer it, but we can see a light there, can't we? The more intense the competition between the US and China is, the more countries are torn in choosing between the US for security and China for the economy. But will nations increasingly band together in resistance against being forced to make this choice? And that's an idea that I saw um, put forward by uh, Mabubani, um, who says that, uh, who is arguing that after COVID, countries should um, focus on the economy and set aside a pause, the whole uh, geopolitical struggle. And then lastly, I'll say that I think that uh, Horace Campbell is correct in seeing progressive movements as starting to coalesce, but are they sufficiently strong to utilize the divisions that are emerging among elites to their advantage? Uh, so that the progressive uh, forces can form a further pole in their own right in a multipolar pattern of influence. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Great, uh, Jenny. Thank you so much. So, um, so thought provoking, I think. Um, so questions uh, and comments for Jenny. Um, okay. Yes, Mick, please go ahead. And okay. then I have one too, but please raise your hand or just wave your hand at me or whatever. Okay. Yeah. It's very dark here because it's um, late in the evening and I haven't fathomed out how to use the lights because I'm not in Beijing at the moment. Um, thank you, Jenny. I mean, that was a very thoughtful and interesting presentation. I just wanted to make a couple of remarks. I mean, I think, you know, to understand dual circulation, you have to look at what happened in the past. What happened in the past was that China opened up to foreign investment in production activities, often in processing industries. Through that, it accumulated large trade surpluses. It then used the revenues that were generated by that trade, those trade surpluses to purchase US treasuries. And that, that model, in a sense, was broken, you know, when, um, well, with the financial crisis and then with the trade war. And what, what's actually interesting about um, dual, dual circulation is that it is connected with a lot of other changes that are taking place in China. Because in, in a way, that period of extraordinary rapid economic growth led to a huge increase in corruption. It was associated with large increases in social inequality. It was associated with the largely increasing divide between the countryside and the city and between the west of, 
and the center northeast of China and then the east, eastern coast. And to some extent, you know, those, those issues were generating very, very significant social tensions. And what you actually started to see, you know, from about 2003 was a shift quite in, in a whole, on a whole series of fronts and it's been intensified under Xi Jinping, who is in fact extraordinarily popular. And it's also very interesting that if you look at what's happening to the sort of position views of young people today, I mean, they clearly deeply admire Xi, but they also admire Mao, you know, and they admire, you know, the concern with equity, fairness, justice, equality, and so on, that was seen as being associated with that era. But you, there, there are a whole series of things taking place. There's this, this internal circulation, on the one hand, obviously, is creating a domestic, a, a power, strong domestic market that is of extreme interest, of course, to uh, other parts of the world. But it's also associated with the regeneration of the countryside. You know, there's a very strong shift in resources. It started a while ago, you know, putting, getting pu public enterprises to put infrastructure into rural areas, recovering something like 10% of the costs, you know, to lay the foundations for a regeneration of the countryside. It's been associated with a very serious poverty alleviation program, basically designed to raise the incomes of the poorest people in China. It's been associated with the introduction of, of a new health insurance scheme for people in rural areas. And a, so a, a reinstatement, if you like, of the kind of health, health security that actually existed up until about 1978. So you have to see it as being connected with the, this program of social reform. And C has even spoken about moving towards a situation in which the Gini by 2035 will approach about 2.5, which is among the lowest in the world. So that's very important. But at the same time, you know, it's also associated with this the strategic technology challenge that has been posed by sanctions and a realization that China has in some of these key technology sectors to be more, more reliant. So you've got China 20, 2025, but you've also got China standards, 2035, setting standards for the industries of the, the next industrial revolution. So I think, you know, these are aspects that one also needs to take into account, as well as these international dimensions that Jenny paid a great deal of attention to. The only question I had, you know, was in what sense do the United States pose security for other parts of the world? Sorry, I didn't catch the question, Mick. Could you please... So in what sense does the, does the United States provide security for other parts of the world? <laughs> you know, because, you know, I mean, there are, these, there, are, there are new security arrangements established with Shanghai Corporation Organization and so on. So there are alternative ways of establishing security than those that are offered by the United States, which, I mean, to my mind, has just brought extraordinary insecurity, you know, in many parts of the world. Sure. Um, Jenny, do you want to take uh, these comments and questions first and then we'll go around again? I have several questions here, so. Yes, uh, yes, okay, I better do it otherwise. Yes, uh, although you'll I'll, forget I'll when you're away from it. So, uh, <laughs> yes, I was, I'm, my focus was on, uh, on multipolarization and, uh, and of course there are all those developments going on internally and I've just found that very interesting, the whole idea of turning the vicious circle into a virtuous circle and and then and then uh, correcting those imbalances um and those uh, you know that social deterioration uh, that we've seen with the open door policy um and i think that the 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 chinese talk about the three there are three particular Im Im imbalances and one is the 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 um the detachment of finance from the real economy the other one is, I think it's the urban and the rural, uh, if I'm thinking correctly, if I'm remembering right. And the other one is the detachment of the uh, real estate um, sector for, from, uh, uh, from the rest of the economy. So they're, they're looking at, at, uh, at correcting those uh, imbalances. Um, and I, what I find so fascinating about dual circulation, and it really challenges at the edges of my understanding is because I've gone back to reading volume two, because the way that you you read about dual circulation in, in the Western uh, from Western commentators, they clearly have just that 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 typical 
uh, limited view of a market and they don't understand uh, what's, how Marx understood circulation and how Marx understood the relationship between production and consumption and production and circulation and how Marx looked at all those different points in the circulation process, at which point crises could occur. And so, you know, chi the Chinese state is using the market and it's using the market more because it's confident that it can intercede at these different points of uh, where a crisis might break out in the circulation process. But that's the kind of thing that I, I, I find fascinating in terms of US security. You know, I think it's, um, you know, I don't, I think that the capitalist classes are not stupid. They know that China is committed to socialism and that has been the problem all along. It's always been the problem all along and all those elites in uh, in East Asia, they know perfectly well, and they wonder what the future is for them, and that's why they look uh, to the U.S. Uh, for security, and that's why China has been so clever in reassuring them that there is a future for them in, in the market, but it's just that the market is just not going to be directed uh, completely towards profit uh, and that it's going to uh, be more uh, attentive uh, to, to social need. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of questions, I think, um, in, on the question of the relations between security and the economy in terms of the choices that, that, uh, these, that other countries are being forced to make and the kind of, uh, the kind of the pressures that it is putting on the uh, on the elites, quite frankly, that it's pulling the elites in this direction and that direction. And that could possibly create opportunities for progressive movements, if only they could get their strategies right. Correct, exactly. Okay, so I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to hang back a little. I know Ariella and Alan have questions. Do other, others have questions for Jenny? I will put myself last on this matter. Okay, Ariella, please go ahead. And then you are next. Thank you, Radhika. This is a brief question. Um, it's related to the statement that uh, you said, um, is it late uh, uh, for the US uh, to, um, how to say, to stop China's influence in the world? Is it, this is the moment? And I would say in Latin America, maybe it is the moment because we have a strategic framework which was approved in August 2020. And uh, what is that? That it stated that uh, we must stop the Latin American countries, the Western Hemisphere must stop China's influence. But I think this is not possible anymore, especially in, in investments in the field of um, technology. Uh, Chile has opened uh, its uh, frontier, uh, its licitations, and uh, Huawei is uh, participating. Uh, Ecuador uh, wanted also to make a licitation and buy the uh, 5G technology, the U.S. have mm, made a big uh, loan in order to not to mm, uh, not to licitate the uh, Huawei, but Ecuador is going to make it. And uh, Brazil, Brazil is uh, is in the middle of a great fight, and we in Peru have. Uh, very big investments in uh, ports and I think this cannot stop although the US uh, wants to stop them and uh, Biden ha uh, has not say uh, anything uh, bec uh, about uh, China's influence I think they don't have any more the, the force to stop them they have so much problems inside thank you Great. Uh, shall we take one or two more, uh, uh, Jenny? Yes. Okay. So, uh, who did I have next? I think I had Alan next. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. So that was extremely interesting, Jenny. And I, I'd like to urge you, you maybe already have written something up, but if you could write up what you said, or maybe we can try and get it transcribed. I just think there's so much to absorb in what you've said, and people are going to be so interested in it. With, with the other talks too, by the way, you know, that, that having it in written form. I know the kids these days, everybody's into video and, <laughs> and whatever, but sometimes text is a helpful communicative device. I have a couple of questions, one short one, maybe a bit longer. The short one is, I, is, the, is the new plan yet made public? I know that there's been a resume of it, but I believe it has to go to the National People's Congress and that before that, it is actually going to be circulated publicly. And I think that if that happens, it would be very interesting for us to have an analysis of that plan as one of the topics of our discussion, unless it's already been published, in which case your analysis will, will serve. The, the next question is really about how should, uh, it's, it's to do with the objectives of this group, Manifesto Group. How, what is the model of how countries should react to China? That, that's because the essential question we face in Canada and in, in the imperialist countries is what does it mean for an imperialist country to reorient, to take China into account? And it's a very fundamental question because you see, I think the issue is not just socialism. The issue is actually imperialism. And capital, Radhika and I have been for a long time saying and moving towards saying, look, there's no such thing as an imperialist stage of capitalism. It was, it was, it was built on colonialism. So in its past, it was imperialist. The form of it changed. The new imperialism was definitely a new form of it, but it was always, it could not have existed without colonialism, without Columbus, essentially. The second thing is it never stopped. That de there's this myth that people have that decolonization ended imperialism. Now I'm now working very hard on, on looking at the, um, the economics of the relation between the North and the South. And the gap in, in, in poverty levels is, in income is extraordinary. I think people sometimes don't realize how big it is. Um, I'll just give you an example. There are 5 million people in the world living below the average level of income of the poorest 10% of the American population. Okay, and then just a couple yeah. of in, otherwise we will just discuss, we will have a oh, new okay. paper. Uh, uh, you okay. can give but, your but, paper another time. Uh, uh, sure, but, but let me finish on this point because it is very important. It's based on robbery. It's based on the wealth of the North exists because of the poverty of the South. This was the message of the old development economist, the Prebish and Singer and everybody, which economics has lost. It's destroyed the theory of development and replaced it by ridiculous Barrow, Salai, Martin theories of growth, which have no, no relation to what's going on in the world whatsoever. So one needs to restructure the foundation of economics to explain that it will be a benefit to the people of the North for the South to develop. Why? Because everything will be cheaper because their productivity will rise. Who will lose? The monopolies. That's, it is still monopoly capitalism. It is the big monopoly, the mining and financial interests for sure, but also the high tech. The whole war is to stop the South getting North technology, for the North always to stay that 10 years ahead, which means that the terms of trade are such they buy commodities from the South and they sell high tech to the South and the South loses out in unequal exchange. It's very, it, it's, it's always been true, but that truth has to be re-rescued. So the message is that I think the imperialists are gonna have to junk their monopolies. That's what they're really gonna have to do. And that the, the, the people of the North will be better off through the growth of the South. And that is, is a message which is not, you know, Trump is, Trump thinks, Trump is basically saying you will be extinguished by the growth of the South. He, he's basically saying they will do to us what we did to the Indians. And, and we have to counter that message and say, no, it's good for the world. Okay, any other questions or points? <clears throat> okay, then I, I would just like to make a couple of, sorry. Can I respond to Alan? Yes, please. And then take you, because otherwise my brain won't be able to and, cope with Alan that. And, and Ariella, yes. With your questions. Um, the short question, Alan, um, I think it's going to be made public um, in a couple of months. So we can just uh, keep our eye on that. Um, 
And the, the longer question um, of how, how should countries react to the rise of China, um, I think that's another session. Uh, it's in my mind all the time the debate is going on in Britain. I think it's very interesting to see how uh, in a, that Europe has taken a step in that direction. Um, because, as I said, it's accepting, whereas the United States is resisting uh, and wants to contain China's rise. Um, the, the Europeans uh, can see there's something in it for them. I was very interested uh, in that example of Bolivia uh, with the uh, Chinese and the Germans cooperating together in order to um, develop the uh, uh, lithium. And I think that there is uh, in the uh, EU-China treaty, if it is ratified, uh, we're going to see a lot more cooperation between Chinese and European firms, for example, in Africa. Um, and so this, this whole, um, you know, these dynamics of the international uh, markets of trade and investment are, are, are changing. Um, then um, I think that uh, I've read a very interesting paper, I might send it to Alan, uh, about uh, how much uh, labour hours China has lost, trillions of labour hours. And I, I'd really like to discuss how uh, or understand better how developing countries lose labour hours and how they can recapture uh, labour hours. And it's not simply a question of, of the, uh, you know, investment at the point of production. And um, then, um, I'm sure, yeah, there's lots to talk about in terms of monopolies. In terms of um, how countries should react on the question of uh, Latin America, and very interesting to hear that you think that the moment has passed. It was actually uh, Kevin Rudd, uh, the former Australian um, prime minister who, who posed that, I heard him pose that question and say that the moment with US needs its allies, but it's too late, it's lost them because they're starting to, you know, to go off to China. What I want to know is whether the countries in the face of the competition between the US and China will turn towards the regions and build up their regions, which is what Mabubami was uh, suggesting. Mm -hmm. That, uh, the, and also the quote that I gave you right at the very beginning was that, 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 you know, that these kinds of tre trends uh, would be strengthened that the, the countries would look to their neighbours uh, in order to, to strengthen their positions. And I think that's all that I have to say about that. So, okay, before we move on to the planning, I just wanted to make a couple of observations. Um, I actually think, uh, um, Jenny, that the point you pose about uh, imperialism and understanding it historically and understanding where you're at is a really big question because in, if you, if, if you follow the argument I made in geopolitical economy, it is possible to consider 1914 as a sort of high noon of imperialism. Since then, it has been declining in power. Uh, but, and and the, the best way you can see that is the extent to which there has been industrialization in different parts of the world. Countries have stood up to it. China has stood up to it, et cetera, et cetera. And I do think that decolonization was a very important moment. I, I've never really understood how the left can, can say, you know, well, uh, decolonization means nothing. You know, you had imperialism in the past. You have imperialism now. No, it means a lot. Uh, the only point is that what Alan is saying about the unequal exchange is also true. So you have to make a certain complex analysis. And I would say that some, I, I should also say that while Alan, and you can imagine the tussles we have in this household, but Alan emphasizes the extent to which there isn't convergence. Whereas I emphasize the extent to which the West, the, the South Southern countries, the rest are catching up, although this is hidden. One of those ways, and I'm not, without at all denying the existence of unequal exchange, one of those ways is a massive exaggeration in the size of US GDP. Thanks, and, and the GDP of all countries where finance plays a big role, thanks to uh, the extent to which um, finance, the, the way in which finance is counted in national income has changed over time. And there is this 
wonderful research of Jacob Assa, who wrote a book called The Financialization of GDP, which is very useful. And he has recently come up with a fantastic new article in Globalizations, which is also worth looking at. So I think this is also important. Because when you say, you know, somehow the American share of, of world GDP has remained at something like 22% or something since the early 1970s. This is simply not possible. There is some statistical skullduggery going on. And when you, so, so I think we, we have to look at that as well because a lot of these arguments rest on statistics, but there is no doubt in my mind that thanks to the assertion of other powers, the rest of the world, the options that imperialism has, has imperialist countries have, has, have been shrinking. And that is the context in which you see Europe and the United States going in two different directions. One final point. It is not necessary for the power of if for the power of imperialism to shrink, it is not necessary that all countries should become equally prosperous as the imperial countries. On the contrary, I think so long as countries have a certain degree of stability, a certain degree of uh, 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 capacity for autonomy, I think they will assert that autonomy and that is enough. You don't, you know, if you say, well, you know, imperialism doesn't end until all countries become equally prosperous as the United States, quite frankly, that moment is not going to come and probably should not come. Otherwise, we will be destroying the planet at a very rapid rate. So I think that developing countries will find their own equilibrium, their own sustainability. They will be very precocious in that sense in their development because they will find solutions which the West did not even think of because it was free to plunder the planet and exploit the labor of other people and so on. So, so while I'm very interested in those lost labor hours and Alan and I both agree, we also have to look at this broader picture. And I would say that multipolarity is, I mean, look, as, as I was saying in one of my articles recently, Thanks to COVID, for the first time in the history of capitalism, a non-capitalist socialist market economy will be the motor of world growth. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. That has huge consequences <coughs> for the future of capitalism. That's why I titled this article in which I wrote it. I titled it, The Future of Capitalism Hangs in the Balance of International Power. And that's also part of it. And then one final point, which actually connects up with what the discussion we were having after Sasha's presentation. Many countries are in a situation where in order to retain some popular legitimacy, because even the world's dictatorship needs to retain some degree of popular legitimacy, let's not go into democracy and whatnot. In order to do that, you have to qualify capitalism to a great extent. And so they are doing so. That's why Russia has, to, you know, so, so you know, uh, 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 well, at least, you know, uh, uh, before Putin's more recent turn towards further neoliberalism, there were a number of uh, elements of social, social elements in stabilization, etc. The only difficulty is that there is no challenge to the power of big capitalists, and whether it is Russia or Turkey or India or Brazil or whatever, you need to have some way of essentially demanding that you cannot keep your cap, you know, your financial flows open. You have to regulate finance. You have to regulate capital, etc. Et so I think that the, there is some pressure, but it is not so overt, and it is not, cannot be seen. So we have to find a way of talking about that as well. So anyway. two quick comments. Two quick comments. Um, you know, the, the the power of imperialism. You can say it, it sort of waned, but I mean, up, after the debt crisis, without doubt it increased in its significance, you know, yeah. through Washington consensus and so on. But obviously, I mean, China was the case of a country that managed to take advantage of what happened, you know, from the 1970s and 1980s to, to grow essentially by not adopting. By the way, India was path. a softer version of that too in those decades, but yes. Yeah. But I mean, India another aspect of another, another important aspect of it was this smiling curve. You know, because basically in, the, in some of the key te technologies that drove the internet revolution, United States corporations basically dominated the, the production of knowledge, the design production, the design of commodities. They were then produced in other parts of the world. And then they were sold elsewhere. And most of the value added is actually generated at that uh, research design end and secondly at that marketing end. And what China has done by sort of trying to move up, you know, the value chain is it's actually started to threaten the position 
right, of some of these uh, leading US corporations in, in these technologies of the internet age, but more especially, you know, of a new age of uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, any other questions, points? I think, Jenny, you, you, so maybe this is a good segue into our planning session. Can I, just, to... can I just make just a, uh, well, I'll just make a, one observation, I think. Um, um, you know, we can, we can, we've seen the economic drift, you know, and Danny Kwa actually has plotted mm -hmm. the, the shift in the, the line of, uh, of economic weight, uh, moving more and more and more towards the east. Um, but uh, this isn't simply a step-by-step -step quantitative, there are also qualitative jumps in the tectonic planes. And I think that what is, we've seen China, for example, take, uh, you know, setting up the AIIB and, uh, and various, you know, the, the BRICS Bank and so on and so forth. Uh, but I think that what's happened with these two deals um, is that uh, ch for once, <laughs> Another country other than the United States has taken the initiative. And when you lose the initiative, I th you know, you can feel the shift. Yes. And I agree with Radhika that I'm not going to sit and wait until every last uh, labor hour that has flown free out of the oh. developing countries stops. Um, I think that it, the, that the shift is is more uh, political in terms of the multipolarization and the balance uh, uh, the balance between powers. Uh, so anyway, the masses to discuss, isn't there? So thank you very much. I just want to give a simple number. This is the number of countries that will catch up within within fifty years with the average growth rate of the uh, the first world at the rates of growth. <laughs> That they went through from 2000 until today six six countries with catch up that's the reality of those that's going to change of course now but um that's the kind of thing we should be looking at and danny Kwa has suggested looking at that um, okay so so this is this is a, a, a obviously